I thought, Lord, that's a terrible place to be. <laughs> Lord, the whole thing is not who you fuck it. Here I am. Came in 60, started to work out here in 67 and trying to hang on. So I learned something every day I go out there. Something new, something different. And this is what our big swamp looks like. If you haven't seen a map of the swamp, this is it. Over here's a couple, and over here's a couple. Um, it's roughly 38 miles long and 25 miles wide at its widest point. But as you can see, that's, that's right in the middle, right across here. Uh, there are four major entrances into the legal <laughs> We're located up here at the top of Okefenokee Swamp Park, which was opened in 1946, I believe. It was the opening day. Uh, the next one down this way is a little non-commercial, but it belongs to the National Wildlife Refuge, and it's called Kingfisher. Uh, there were four men who owned 50,000 acres in there, John King and three others. Sermon, Sanders, and Sessions, and they own 50,000 acres, and they ran a heat mining operation in there for a number of years. And then they went doing it. Dredging the peat out left fantastic boat trips. <laughs> Just fantastic boat trips. Maybe six feet deep and 30, 40 feet wide in some places. Then it gnaws down. <laughs> and it really gets gnarled. Uh, the next one is. Down here on the east side, that's the Swanee Canal Recreation Area. That's the federal entrance, National Wildlife Refuge, Department of Interior. Uh, they manage and protect the swamp. They manage, manage the visitors, they manage the wildlife, they manage uh, fires, they manage almost every. Somebody help me. You've got some refuge people here. Who's refuge? Yes. What other management activities does the refuge participate in? Hunting, Oh, yeah. We yes. <coughs> do allow some wildlife management as well. Yeah, wildlife management. Yeah, especially those endangered species. Those fellow called red cockaded woodpeckers. <laughs> they really watch out for that little fellow. And we'll see him several times before this course is over. Uh, the Swanee Canal Recreation there is also a major entrance for uh, canoeists who will go into the swamp. However, we'll look at that again. Over here on the west side is Stephen Foster State Park. So there are three different management systems going on at the entrances. This is private up here where we are. Privately owned. This is federal. That's federal. This is state owned. That's a state park. Parks are managed for people. Refuges are managed for wildlife. People come second. So, so the management philosophy is different for each agency. This agency up here is a privately owned, managed by our board of directors who, who see to it that we adhere to the law and also how we're at I see, when I see pretty pictures in the swamp or in a magazine, I cut them out. <laughs> I like pretty pictures. Some photographers found this scene, it's very typical of Oka to Oka. And there are isolated places where you can see this very scene. There are hundreds, thousands of them out there. We'll be referring to those. Uh, Mark, let's give out this. And here we see the map of the swamp. We're going to look at some of the details of the swamp, the, the, the geography of it. Uh, and I think you'll find inside this next handout, uh, two or three pages, you'll see a map just like this. Uh, there are 70 major islands in the swamp, 70 islands. Not major, but there's 70 total. Some of them are just an acre or two, some of them are just 15 or 20,000 acres, like this. We're on Cow House Island. 
This is Kalahata, the largest island in the zone. It used to be managed by uh, a very strong-willed lady called Beauty of Stone. You might have heard of Miss Stone. Uh, so this is Cal House Island up here. And I, I hope that if you're here for a learning session, I'll be glad to do all the learning activities you want to. Uh, so one way you learn is by reading and writing. And it's a simple way, but it works. So if I give you a blank map, you might could uh, label the blanks too, couldn't you? So, all right. Then we have these dotted areas. These dotted areas are called prairies. Prairies are wide open spans covered by grasses, sedges, orchids, uh, and plants. Uh, a few water lilies. By the way, we have four kinds of water lilies in the world. Four different kinds. They are all beautiful. And down here in the middle of the swamp, we have another major island. This is Billy's Island. Billy's Island is probably the most famous because that's, you go down, go down that entrance, you, you go into a big forest, a huge forest of cypress trees, a big lake, big open lake there, Billy's Lake, uh, right in here. So here's the park, Stephen Foster State Park. Uh, from there, you can go up to Minnie's Lake, Big Water, Dinner Pond, and come out right here at the park. I used to do that many, several times a week. Uh, down here in the south end, that's a, a, a small island on the east side here is Bugaboo Island. Bugaboo, and it looks like it's just a, just a, you know, a few miles over there. So you can get out and start walking. <laughs> Then it's a different story. And somebody tried that. Down here is Chesser Island. Chesser. Can you, can you find that map? Okay. Chesser Island was obviously occupied by Chesser family. There were two over there. Put them together, put the two families together and had enough little school bus. <laughs> They would come down there and drive out as far as they could, and the kids would walk through, through the water, and they had a little trail fixed out, some logs, some step logs they'd walk on, and they could meet the school bus every day. Uh, here's one of the bigger islands in the south, that's Blackjack Island. Blackjack, and down south here, I think this is Mitchell Island, and Soldier Camp Island. All these islands have names that have some some significance to somebody when they were named. And I don't know all of those. Mr. Billy Dawes over here, he's probably the captain. He probably knows where most of them got their names. Uh, over here is another prairie, Sap Prairie, Grand Prairie, Honey Prairie. Prairies are all over the swamp, primarily on the east side. Big forests, major forests, are primarily on the west side. And because of the composition of those forests, that's where we find the bears, black bears. Most of the black bears <coughs> occupy this northwest region right in here. When you go down to Stephen Foster, go up this pocket and get on here, uh, you might see a bear across the road. You might see one at the edge of the woods. You'll certainly see deer and foxes, raccoons, possums, lots of wildlife. Ladies and gentlemen, there are 1,045 different species of animals and plants that live here. 424 vertebrates, 621 plants, different plants. So what a composition, what a biodiversity. They evaluate a piece of land they, in a park or a refuge like this. The biodiversity is one of the criteria that is measured in order to evaluate that land. And we certainly qualify. We qualify internationally. There's an organization called Ramsar that came through and, and looked at our swamp and decided it was of international significance and should be protected. All, at all costs from advancement by, by 
development. Development is the greatest danger to wetlands in America. Development, I mean commercial, agricultural, residential, or new, new even airports, even airports. And they would take things just like this if they needed. But fortunately, we have some good laws in protect us. I think you have a page of data. And this is just stuff that you can look at on your own. If anybody has any questions about this, I'd be happy to explain it before we go over it with you. Uh, where does the water come from? How does the water come from? There are two rivers running out of here. How does it get in? But it's happening right out there now. That's how it happens. Rainfall. Rainfall is a major source of impact. And don't just rain on the swamp. It rains up, up here on the hill, too. And so some of this soaks in, of course. What does soak in does what? Runoff. Runoff. That is another major, particularly on that northwest quadrant. Look at that northwest quadrant on the mountain up in here. You see this long stretch over here from way across the home field? Down in here, there are 14, 14 small creeks that when it rains, they run. They run. And some of them run when it don't rain. But all of them run when it's raining. So that's a major input area as well. And we'll see how that has been the most significant in the, in the creation of the swamp. That area was a very important part when the swamp was created. <coughs> Those creeks are running into the swamp. Yes. So those creeks carry with them minerals, nutrients, they carry decomposition products, and they also carry pollution. What kind of pollution? Gasoline, oil, hydraulic fluids, battery fluids, anything that comes out of heavy equipment falls on the ground. If it falls on the ground, it gets dissolved in water, and off it goes, down the hill. So there is some hydrocarbons found in the water on that northwest quadrant. It's not a real serious problem, but it's there. Okay. Uh, water goes out to Swanee and St. Mary's. Here's how most of it, it says those 14 creeks over there. This is just a few of them. This is not all of them. This is a few. The watershed surrounding the swamp, we'll see that in color shortly, is 500,000 acres of watershed. Most of it, 400,000 of it, is on that northwest part. The other 100,000 is around the edge of the swamp. The periphery of the swamp is higher than the swamp. So there's a slight grade there. Very slow, very little grade. But it runs, we have some runoff that comes into the swamp. Then there is also groundwater. Shallow groundwater aquifer. If you take a hose and, and a water pipe, and start sticking a hole down in the ground, turn the water on high, you can blow a hole down. That's how we put posts down out here in the swamp. That's how they make a boardwalk out in the swamp. They both blow a hole out with the water pump. And then they set the post in it, sand goes back. It ain't going nowhere. So, that's how the water gets into the swamp. When it gets out through the Swanee and the St. Mary's, they have been dried up down or two. 79 the St. Mary's Drive. 74, I believe it was, the, St. the, the Swanee Drive. Uh, when we do have a lot of rain and we have excessive water, all the, the water gets to high, the boat well is covered, and it runs out Cypress Creek and Big, Big Creek on the south end. So there are some other exits. Uh, any comments or questions about the rest of this? Anything down here? How dry is it in the swamp now compared to Pardon? the past? How dry is it today compared to 74 or 90? Right there, you can tell us. He was out there today. Yeah, well, we made it to Mud Lake with a Georgia Travel Magazine the other day, and that's the first time we've had smooth sailing out there in a couple of years. Yeah. And uh, we've been out there about three times. And, 
you know, we've got boat trail cut through there and you know, two hour trails clear for 45 minutes, got plenty of water in it right now. We can maintain the water level we got right now and get a few more of these spring rains, we're going to be in good shape for sure. Yeah, spring and early summer is when you get most of our water. The latter part of the summer is usually dry. The fall is cool and moist. Uh, and the winter is usually dry. Okay. The altitude right outside this door, right over there across the street, is 128 feet. It's a GP. Okay. U.S. Geodetic Survey Bronze. Altitude mark, 128 feet out of the river, up on the hill. Um, down to the water level, it's probably down to 120, 122. 122. What's up? We got, our, we got an official weather station. Water level established now of the refuge. They came up here and put it on a meter. Um, so uh, that's 122. Down at the south end, 105 feet, when water goes out, it used to be 105 feet. So that was about a, about a 40 feet to the top, over about, this is about 18 miles, 18 miles, it's 276 inches over 1,140,480 inches, so that comes out to a fall of about 1 inch every 4,000 132 feet. About three quarters of a mile. I'm just about <clears throat> about three quarters of a mile uh, is one inch of drop. That's it, if it were straight level all the way down, but it's not just flat level. There are five water compartments inside the swamp. Five water compartments in here. And they aren't they aren't necessarily stair step fashion. It depends on what the water level is as to which way the water flows. If they're higher than those ridges inside the swamp, then it goes one way. If it's, if it's below that ridge, it goes the other way. You can go up a boat trail one day and the water's flowing through you. Go back come back the next day and it's flowing downstream. That has happened. So that's because of those terraces in there. Those are the five. We'll, we'll look at them shortly. Let's move right along. There are 31,000 acres of, of lakes uh, and ponds, water courses, uh, about 60 lakes. And a lake is a nebulous thing in here because there are no edges. It just kind of merges like a prairie area. It merges into the forest. There's water practically everywhere. On the normal water level, flying over the swamp is the best way to see it. Now when you fly, you can look down to the ground and you see the sun reflecting off of the, the water. You can see that what looks like vegetation down there, but there's water on everywhere. Lots of water. And that water is flowing in, in very in this fashion, sheet flow, and it only flows in the upper part of the of the stream too. This one's only about two feet deep, maybe three feet. Then every now and then you hit a hole. There are some holes up there. <coughs> you hope fill in one. Billy's Lake is the largest, about 60 acres, and when you get on Billy's Lake, you can easily see. Most of you have probably been. If you haven't, I encourage you to go see. It's worth your time and effort to go down there. Total acres of prairies, about 100,000 acres. Uh, prairies change. Living things change their environment. Don't. Think about it. Living things take in liquids, solids, and gases. Living things excrete liquids, solids, and gases. And they're not necessarily coming out on the same way they went in. They're changed because the energy is taken out, taken out and the waste material is given off. So that changes the environment that they were growing in. Uh, 
Um, okay. Prayer is Just so right here. We went through territory prairie. And it must have been in, in a small prairie or small open area. 50 acres. You know, about 50 acres. Uh, solid sun dunes. Oh. Most beautiful oh. thing I've ever seen in this one. Solid sun dunes, just pink. Oh. The surface of the ground, the, of the vegetation is pink with the sun dunes. Anyway, fantastic. Other places, those carnivorous plants, two, three, four feet high. Pitcher plants, four, and I, I, I think if you put, 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 went all the way to the bottom and measured it from the bottom, which is under it, to the top of it, it would be more than four feet. Uh, scientists come from all over the world here to study these giant uh, uh, pitcher plants. That's his name, Saracenia minor Okefenoki insis. Okefenoki insis. Because they get big in here. <laughs> not sure why, but they do get big. Uh, underneath, practically from, from here all the way to, to Fargo, all the way down to the Florida state line, and over to the west side, the floor of the swamp is covered with peat. This stuff right here. This is what the swamp is covered with. This is partially decayed vegetation. Partially decayed vegetation. It grows or it gets produced at the rate of about one inch every 53 years. So we just round it up. Who's, who's going to quibble over here? Uh, every 53 years, another inch. <coughs> How does it get there? What is it? It grows from, it comes from the plants that lived upon it and died and contributed to it every year. Fifteen tons per acre. <coughs> Fifteen tons over every acre. How many acres? Four hundred thousand. Four hundred thousand acres. Not counting the islands. We'll put the islands in there. We'll put four hundred and thirty-eight thousand. So that's a lot of stuff. And folk by that comes out to over six million tons over the entire swamp. Six million tons a year. So what happens is when the plant dies, it falls in the water, the pH of the water is so low, very acid, uh, 3.2 to 4.2, the back the aerobic bacteria of decomposition can't do their job. So there's always some left over when they get through with it. And year before they're through with it, the next year's generation population has already fell on top of it and covered it. And year after year, it builds up. So that in some places, this stuff can be as much as 12, 14, even 16 feet deep. That's all. And, and you have to take into account for compaction, too. An inch up here on top is not an inch down there on the bottom, 10 feet down. So it, uh, this is a carbon sink. This makes the swamp, the entire bottom of the swamp, is a carbon sink. That's, that's where carbon is bound up chemically in the plant tissues and hasn't been broken down. When it's completely broken down, you know, it's just dust. It would be just dust. That's why I put fertilizer in the field, because if the potatoes and onions and wheat and corn take it up, so we've got to put some back. And it's the same way in here. Uh, these are bound. This is, this is not available for plant growth. You'd think, boy, well, plants are really growing that. Well, why don't you just stick your seeds in the bale of hay? <laughs> it's the same thing. They're bound into the tissues of that plant in that bed of hay and in this field. So it's a, it's a nutrient poor environment. The water is nutrient poor. There's a, there's a heap to do with peat. That, we'll spend some time with peat on this. Uh, 
fire, fire farms, fire, we have fires in the swamp, we've always had fires. The swamp's only about 5,000 years old, maybe 5,500 at the most. So it's, it's just a blink in the eye of the geologic time scale. Just a blink. So 5,000 years, uh, we know there's been fires. How do we know? You go down to the core, you take a peak core, Peak door goes all the way to the sandy floor of the deep. Uh, and when you put it out and lay it out in a tray, push it out in a long tray, and every minute and then you see a black layer. Every two, three, four, six inches, you'll see a black layer. Charcoal. <laughs> Charcoal. <laughs> and so the, the scientists take a sample of that above and below. And then in the middle of that charcoal and see what kind of pollen grains they can find. By studying the pollen grains and identifying what the plants were, they know exactly what the community looked like above when it was formed. In the neat that is I'm just a fascinated me by it. I work with a fellow in the summertime down on the coast. He, he does that for a living. Okay. About every 20, 30, or 40 years, we'd have a fire. Back in the 60s and 70s, we didn't have many, didn't we? Uh, then come the 80s, uh, we had a fire in the 80s, I think. In the 90s, we had a couple. We had a lot of fires, several fires every year, but then lightning strikes, it burns to the edge, edge of the water, and goes out. But when we had those long droughts that we've been experiencing for the last 10 years, 10 years, we've had four fires in the last 10 years. Normally they're 20 or 30 years apart. So this is climate change. And it's not unnatural. Man has contributed to it. But it's not unnatural because it's been going on all these thousands of years. Fire is normal, natural, and necessary for Penelope to stay a swamp. If it didn't burn, the process of succession would just fill it up, wouldn't it? That's why we keep the edge of our ponds cleaned up, or it'll start filling in. We'll look at succession one evening. Next week. Don, does the sill down in St. Uh, Fargo have anything to do with that? Do with what? The sill and the fires and the holding of the water in the swamp. No, no that, didn't, that didn't change the climate. The climate's what, made, what makes fire frequency, determines frequency. Uh, but the water level did not. I mean, the seal didn't make that happen. Anybody have a comment on that? I don't have any other opinion about it. Sonny and I stopped there and looked at that seal and the gates. I remember going over it one time and we went down the Swan River. We started right up, right up there in the water and went all the way to the Gulf of Mexico. But when we got down to the, to the seal, we had to get out and tow our boats over. Uh, so now you can't even get over there. It's dry. Dry over there now. Okay. Significant fires are important because significant fires will burn all the way into the peak bed. And when it burns into the peak bed and it's big enough, when the rains do come back and it fills up, it creates lakes. Uh, the fire of 1844, the fire of 1932 and 3, the fires of 54, all were, were crater forming fires. They were all crater forming fires, so they created lakes. So lakes are, they're not permanent. They're here for a while, but that process of succession is going on. They're filling in all the time. In order to study and understand the swamp, you have to change your clock. Set your, our clocks were set on minutes, hours, days, months, and years. That cypress tree over there, this clock set on decades and centuries and millennia. A whole different time frame. And so that's 
That's why we have such difficulty perceiving succession, conceiving, seeing how it changes over the time. And what you do is you look at one picture. It doesn't just all happen at once. It happens one leaf at a time. When a leaf falls off the tree, that contributes to the people. It's all, it's all one thing at a time. Okay, let's look at some of the critters that live in here. Actually, this is not correct here. There's 237 words now. I talked with Sarah just the other day. Uh, she sent me some new figures. 237 different birds from the sand hills to the hummingbirds. They're all through here. And they're just beautiful birds. Uh, amphibians, this is this is a mecca for amphibians. Oh, the scientists do come from around the world because we have such biodiversity of amphibians. Toads, frogs, amphiomas, sirens. Strange looking critters. You probably caught them on a hook or a line sometimes and, and it looked like an eel, but it didn't have no fins. <laughs> it might have two, one, two, or three little legs, or four little legs, with one or two or three toes. Weird looking things, and they're snotty. Yeah. <laughs> and they'll bite the fire out of them, too. Turtle, we've got 15 turtles. <laughs> The biggest turtle and the biggest freshwater turtle in the world lives right here. Until about three, four weeks ago, he died. His name, that wasn't Methuselah, was it? They lived a long time. Even that little box turtle, you know, the little brown and black and yellow striped turtle you find in the edges of the woods of upland, 125 years. <laughs> He will follow you all the way through your life. Yeah. <laughs> uh, yeah. Mammals, about 48. I think Sarah told me there were 48 mammals. We really can't count the Florida cougar, although we have very good evidence that he's been through here. And here especially on this east side. Uh, but we can't count them. And we certainly can't count the mid north anymore. The red wolf does not exist here. I think the last one was in the 1921. Uh, snakes, 37 snakes, and many movies make a big deal out of snakes. But that's entirely unnecessary. Those of you who work here and, and live close by and, and canoe and camp and do things in the swamp, how often do you see a snake? It, it, it is rare. It really is rare. It is, in my experience. We have a lizard. A wind. 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 A There are, there are five poisonous snakes, so I don't mean to minimize the danger of snakes. Water moccasins are always a present threat. And whether you see them or not, they're out there. Eastern Diamondback, Cambridge, or Timber Rambler, and the Pig. Those are the three, uh, four most poisonous, and, and they're all poisonous. But the most poisonous is a coral snake. The coral snake is a, has a different kind of venom. It, it attacks the nervous system, and it only takes one seventh as much of his venom to kill a person. Two milligrams for an adult. Two milligrams, and that's just a dink. That's just a dot. Uh, as opposed to 14 milligrams for a, a diamond dot. And that big diamond dot can give you a big dose. So it's just best to leave them all alone. Don't be a hero, and certainly don't kill anything in the song. That is really, I guess, all the rules and regulations. <coughs> uh, vegetation is by far the most diverse and the most common. We have grasses, sedges, vines, wildflowers, shrubs, trees. 
that's what makes this one. If there were no plants out there, there'd be no animals. Plants create habitat, they produce food, shelter, oxygen, they take up CO2. Plants are absolutely necessary. Plants always come first. If you take a huge bulldozer and sweep this place out, and then watch what happens, there'd be nothing until the plants come. Only after the plants are established and they create that habitat, that magic word. Okay. I've built that one far enough. <laughs> Let's look at how you want to get in there. Well, I couldn't find one of the village lakes, so I just drew up one. This is, this is how you get to the south end. Down And that's not even a good map. And that's Stephen Foster State Park down here. And that's the little boat trail where the gators had that big party good about two years ago. And they were eating all the fish. This is Billy's Lake. Up here is Billy's Island. And if you can make it through here, there's a trail that goes all the way over to the east side. Uh, it's kind of a tough trail, but they're working on it. And this goes up to, this goes up to Minnie's Lake. By the way, I don't think you have this. I'm sorry. Uh, this goes up to Minnie's Lake, uh, Minnie's Lake here, and Big Water, and this goes on up to Dinner Pond. Dinner Pond is about five to six miles out in the swamp southeast of here. Down away. That's, didn't you go down there the other day? Yeah, no, they make it place. Dinner Pond. Yeah. Park. This is the park's uh, boat trails. Picture of the parks. Uh, right here is the boat dock. Here's a gift shop right here. Uh, boat dock, exhibit buildings, and you can ride around here. And there's Mirror Lake over on this side. There's another boat trail leading out here to Skull Lake. And another one, another boat trail that goes on down to the deep, dark swamp. I used to have a boardwalk out there too, by the way. I had a boardwalk there, about a thousand feet long, two shelters on it, about 30 by 30. Uh, we took students out there, did all kinds of good stuff, science activities. Mark went with us a couple of times. Um, but the fire of 207 turned it to ashes. If you go down to Kingfisher, which is about 15, 18 miles down the road, uh, and you come in right here at Kingfisher, come out this canal. If you go north, that's the Red Trail, the Red Canoe Trail, and that leads you over here to Mall Hammock. Uh, and Mall Hammock leads you right back to the middle, right down in the middle of the swamp, is what we call the Middle Forest. <coughs> Middle Fork Run. You can call it Swanee River if you like. Uh, if you go south, if you come in and turn south, that's that's the Green Trail. And it, it turns this way, it comes down here. These are those big wide trails where they dredged out the peat. Uh, and it comes down here to Bluff Lake. These look like large lakes here, and they probably were back when this was printed, which was in the 60s, I think. 59s and 60s, and I'm in there. But here, Bluff Lake is still open, uh, and it's about 13 miles, 12 miles, about 12 miles. Down on the east side, the Swanee Canal, you go in there, which is right here, the Swanee Canal area. Uh, this is the main trail, the main canal uh, that was dug back in the, back in the 1800s. Uh, and it, it comes up here to uh, uh, 
several branches that go out all over the, the prairies. And there's two campsites up here. One of them's called Canal Run, and the other is uh, Coffee Bay. Coffee Bay. That must be it right there. There's in this rest area. And could look there. Bugaboo Island looks like it's just, you know, about a half a mile over there. But it is it's a, it's a real trip, a treat to get over there to it. Mm -hmm. It's not easy to do. That was one of the uh, islands that was mentioned a lot when the fire was going on. They were talking about the bugaboo from the fire and so on. Oh, yeah. Bugaboo. I think you have a copy of this. How much of the swamp is actually uh, covered with the uh, water? If you look at the total swamp basin and watershed, every bit of it is almost a million acres because it goes way up north of the northwest side over here. It goes way up in here and continues into Florida. Where it goes across Highway 94 south, on the south end of the swamp, it's called Hinhook Swamp. Hinhook Swamp. Some of you may have read, they may have a copy of Denise Gray's book called the Hinhook. She also wrote another one, Cracker Child, the Ecology of the Cracker Child. She was all made fun for it. Um, so there's about a million acres in all. So it occupies Hinhook Swamp over the state line and the Osceola National Forest. So the bears actually migrate from up here all the way down to the south end and out into, uh, uh, down into Pinhook and down to Osceola. The biologists are keeping up with the bears and they do a lot of research. <clears throat> the swamp proper 433,000, forest lands about 125,000, <coughs> scrub shrub. That's a funny thing. But when you get out there and you see what's right beside of you right there, you can't see no three feet away from you. That's the scrub shrub. That's the scrub. It's vegetation that's so thick and tied together by those bamboo vines. Those sharp, <clears throat> painful bamboo vines. They don't quit hurting when you pull them out. They still hurt. <laughs> they, they eject a venom, I think. Prairies, about 90,000 of prairies. Swamp islands, 34,000. Lakes and trails, about 30,000. And I don't know where the other is. <laughs> <laughs> but it was on this data sheet. <laughs> <laughs> on the south end, where the Swanee goes out, it takes out about 85% of it. St. Mary's takes out about 10, and Cypress Creek about 4 or 5 percent. Uh, but the most of the water, 80 percent of the water that flows into the swamp, does not run out. 80 percent of it goes off through the evapotranspiration. Evaporation is two-dimensional, length and width, only on the surface. But transpiration is three-dimensional. Those trees create their leaves here on the back of them, all those little stoma are just breathing. <laughs> blowing out water, sucking in CO2, and blowing out water and oxygen. So it's three-dimensional. So for this in another few weeks, what we've already seen, red buds, the dark buds, uh, some of those water plants are already blooming. Uh, some of the pine trees are already pollinating. They're playing house already. Uh, so, in, in, in the next few weeks, Golden Club never will be. They're already open. They're out now. Good. Golden Club, and then the water lilies will come. And then the water lilies will come. They're going to bankers' out. <laughs> they don't hope up until about 9 o'clock in the morning. <laughs> and they go to sleep about 4 in the afternoon. They just close it up. The next morning they just lay in bed until about 9 o'clock and they be peep out. <laughs> Where are we? About 7 o'clock. 
about the time we're breaking. Why don't we do that? Why don't we stop for a little while? Talk to the machine back here. If you have any comments, questions, questions? Can I can I see the hands of the people that did not get a packet? If you did not get a packet, I need to get a count. We've got plenty of them up here. You got more done? Yeah. Oh my goodness. <laughs> This time, I think we're going to start over here on this side and start with these dudes of materials. The floor, although we can know underneath here are 60 feet of this thing, 60 feet of different kinds of sand. And the colors, the colored layers, uh, depending upon the mineral content of where they come from, how they were eroded, how long they were in the, uh, in the spring bed, and finally dropped off into, dropped off with a continental shelf. Uh, so there's 60 feet of sand, on, and underneath that sand is a layer of limestone. This is limestone. This is called the Charlton. It is a formation found in the St. Mary's River, it comes to the, it comes out at the surface of the water, right at the water level surface, which is 60 feet below the water level in the swamp, up the hill. The water level of the swamp, I mean of the uh, St. Mary's River, where I, where I find this, is seven and a half feet above sea level. Seven and a half feet. The water level up in the swamp is about 118, 120. So this is this is much below the swamp. Level. But this is why this is partially why the swamp is there because limestone is susceptible to erosion by acid water. Well, lo and behold, look who's up there? <laughs> acid water, and as it percolates down through the sand and strikes these, this limestone layer, which is a big formation, a huge formation, then it erodes some of it in places here and there, and it eventually, and it's been going on for 5,000 years, so this limestone has now eroded uh, and then down to a point that's called a basin. That's why this basin is here that holds the water. So, and underneath here, Underneath the limestone is a layer of clay. The Hawthorne formation, <coughs> clay, and lots of residuum of, uh, of gravels, rocks, but it also has clay. So that's really what holds the water here. On top of that is peat. This is how it gets its name. This is how the, the trembling earth forms. And we'll look at that next week in detail. See exactly how this becomes an island because that's what's happening all over the song. And if you've never held any peat in your hand, this is this is a little dried up peat. You're welcome to come by and have a feel. This see they burn this in Ireland and Scotland and Northern Europe. They they, they collect it dry and burn it. That's what I did with this, is collect it and dry it. Now, if you want to see the real stuff, this, that's what's in here. This is the real stuff. It's still working. It's still making those gases. Now, this is the gas that's produced. Actually, this is just air in here. Well, I have gas down, right down here. Just a few weeks ago, I came out and me and some boat boys and, and Scott on there helped me. We collected some gas. We have a little method of collecting gas over water, just like you did in college, collecting gas over water. You put a little funnel upside down, the gas comes up through the bottom, collects in the tubes. So that's what that's how we do it. Then there's the swamp water. Swamp water is very soft, very soft. You can, you can wash with a drop of soap, liquid soap. It's so soft. Um, 
It is not hard water at all. It's colored. It's very acid. It has a pH of 3.2 to 4.2. Very acid. It'll hit your teeth. Uh, it, is, it has very little oxygen in it. The oxygen measurements in here range from 2 to about 5, maybe 6. 2 to 5, maybe 6 on a windy day. Um, carbon dioxide level is very high. Carbon dioxide level is like 30, 35. I, I couldn't believe the test when I was doing them out here. And we had students doing them for 30 years. But it consistently, between 25 and 35 parts per million CO2. CO2 is extremely soluble in water, a hundred times more soluble than oxygen. And it is immediately bound to the water molecule to form carbonic acid, which ionizes it and forms hydrogen ion and bicarbonate. So the hydrogen ion from CO2 also acidifies the water. The decay, the decay products of decomposition of the vegetation. Okay. Now, down in this peak, about four to six inches below the surface of the peak bed, it becomes anaerobic. Anaerobic without oxygen, without oxygen. So all the aerobic organisms up here that really are doing the job of decomposing the vegetation, they can't live down here. They're dead. Now the anaerobes take over. And the anaerobes do not completely oxidize, uh, or do not reduce. It's not an oxidizing environment down here. It's a reducing environment. So there's some energy left in the gases. And the gases they produce are the hydrocarbon gases. Methane, ethane, propane, and butane. All the gas thought that you can buy in bottles. And that, they call it natural gas. And it's produced all over the world, everywhere there's an organic decomposition going on. There's methane gas, so-called. But it's actually a combination of all four of them, just that. Why is there not a... <laughs> Let's kind of move this back here a little more and more Methane hydrate 
mock uh, masks. They, they look like dirty snowballs, but they'll burn. Uh, so there's, a, there's, there's methane all over the world. Wherever there is an inorganic decomposition of waste, a sewage disposal plant, that's what goes out of that burner, the top. And you go to a, a, a waste collection dump with the garbage dump, and they seal it off. They always put a couple of pipes in it, and guess what comes out? All that garbage has been building up there for years. It's decomposing methane. Uh, some companies, some cities, actually collect that gas and use it to run their generators to generate electricity for the city. So it's a very viable source of energy. It's not in here. Not in here. <laughs> She's got so much yeah, black. That's what makes it black. Mm -hmm. uh, we're not the only place in the world that has peat beds. Northern Europe has hundreds and thousands of peat beds. And they're over there in several of their, like Finland, uh, and Ireland, Scotland, Germany. Uh, a couple of thousand years ago, human beings were sacrificed and thrown into the peat wastes. They didn't decay. Think about where that is on the latitude of the earth. It's cold up there. The bodies didn't have time to rot. Those bodies were preserved. And this is a body that was dug out. The skin looks like leather. I'm sorry, it's all black. <laughs> But they, they put a black body on a, on a black background. Uh, but he had red hair, she's red hair, and his throat has been cut. His throat was cut all the way across. So this was a sacrifice. Why is his body shaped like that? Because the acid water dissolved his bones. It dissolved the bones and left the skin. And it looks like leather. If you, if you are a scientific American reader, if you look in Scientific American September of 07, bog bodies, 
bog bodies of the north, northern Europe. If, if you just go and Google it, bog bodies, and you get more stuff about it, pictures, how it happens, why it happens, and where the bodies are today. They're still finding bodies. So he definitely has some, uh, some preservative qualities at that temperature, not down here. Out there, a uh, the bog body would just disappear within a matter of weeks. It wouldn't be that way. September of 07, National Geographic, page, uh, page 80, I think it was. Um, I thought that was fascinating when I, when I found that article. Because the pH of the water is so acid, uh, it certainly becomes a factor in determining who's, who lives here. What critters can withstand a pH of 3.2? Very few. Uh, consequently, uh, there are 3.2 to 4.2 is the range. Uh, no, there's a minimum. If it falls below 3.2, those tough critters die. If it goes over 7, <coughs> then those critters are adapted to the low pH, and if it goes too high, then those critters would die. So there's a minimum, a maximum, but there's also an optimum for every species. It's kind of like that little <coughs> curve here that you see in any, any population. You're going to find tolerances and different organisms in different stages of organisms. And A may be more sensitive than the, than the fingering or the hatchet, whatever it might be, the larvae or whatever. And a young, a young fish, for instance, a minnow of a fish, might be a lot more sensitive than the adult. You might find a big old bass out there, but you find very few little ones. You might find big jackfish, and they're out there. There are big jackfish in here, but maybe the best, and it's all based on tolerance. Different organisms have different tolerances uh, on many of the physical factors that surround them. Uh, another thing that happens when, when the pH goes very low is nitrates become nitrites. NO3 becomes NO2. It's still a nitrogen molecule, it's still a nitrogen NO2, but it's not in a form that most plants can use. Most plants use nitrates, and when it goes to a, a nitrite, it's not available. It's like watering your plants with ice cubes. It can't use it, it can't use that form. But with, there, there are some counter effects. There's a, there's a blue-green algae, and a fungus that also, mycorrhizal fungi that live in the swamp water, that do convert atmospheric nitrogen into nitrates. But uh, and as soon as it's converted to nitrates, then the, those other organisms convert it over to a nitrite. So there's lots of interaction from the atmosphere down to the organism. very acid is an increase in CO2. Uh, many of us remember when we were in school that the percentage of carbon dioxide in the atmosphere was 3%. 3%. Well, in 1974 it was 3.3%. In 1984 it was 3.4%. In 1984 94, it was 3.6%. And in 2009, it was 3.8. Well, that was four years ago. The CO2 level in the atmosphere is definitely increasing. And we are part of that. We're not all of it, we're part of it. Uh, and as the CO2 level increases, it's absorbed immediately into the oceans where it has an impact on coral animals. And, and coral animals, usually have an algae that live in, 
and symbiotic relationship with them that creates food for them. So this impact is not just terrestrial, it's not just fresh water, it goes into salt water too. <clears throat> so that's one of the factors impacting the demise of the coral reefs? Yes, it is. It definitely is having an impact on the coral reefs. This is a, a rough map of altitudes throughout the swamp. You see up here at the, at the top, we're up here at 128 feet right here in Swamp Park. And down here at the top of the sill is 108 feet. Down at the Swanee River level, water level, is 105 feet. Uh, around here, look at this. This is Trail Ridge over here. This is why those maps all have such a straight edge here and over there. That straight edge on the eastern border, it's a straight edge right there. And so wildly different on the western border. Uh, so these, these, this gives you some idea of why there are different compartments in the swamp too. Here's, here's the water surface. Now, this is the watershed all the way around up Trail Ridge across Cow House Island here. By the way, there's one creek, one creek that runs out of Cow House into the swamp. On the west side, uh, almost over where Cornelius lives, there's 14 of them. So this is where most of the water comes from, running into the swamp. And by far, the greatest majority goes out the Swanee River. Not that that runs off. It doesn't all run off. Here's those, here's those water terraces. We talked about the five basins. Up here is one, here's one, and here's one, and there's one, the southwest and the southeast. Um, push that up there. Now, they are effective, they become effect effective only on low water. They don't have an impact on high water because the water is way up here above the, the underground, the uh, surface of the soil underneath the water. So here are the major zones, and that's why the water will flow in one direction one day, another direction another day. Uh, this gentleman here spoke to me a while ago. He mentioned that if we had one inch, if we got one inch of water over one acre of land and one acre of swamp, would amount to about 28,000 gallons. 28,000 gallons. Uh, and over 400,000 acres? Think of billions of gallons. I figured it out one time. There's 10 billion, 86 million, and 600,000 gallons of water to raise, raise the levels of the water over the entire swamp, one inch. 10 billion, <laughs> one inch, over the whole swamp for, for, 30, for 12 inches a foot, it would take 130 billion. It's just amazing how much water it takes. Dump. They did everything they could to destroy them. 
Uh, and fortunately, there were some far-sighted people who saw the values of wetlands. Uh, people like Dr. Francis Harper, people like John Muir, people like Rachel Carson. You know, she wrote a book. What was it called? Spring. Silent Spring. Silent Spring. And she woke up a lot of us. She woke up a lot of people. Uh, recently, more recently, a, a man that has made one of the greatest impacts on ecology around the world was right here at the University of Georgia and on Sapporo. Some of you probably know Dr. Eugene Odom. Dr. Odom is, is called the father of modern ecology because he spent 20 years on Sapporo studying the ecology of salt marsh and figured out that, that we need to save our salt marsh. That is why Georgia has 380,000 acres of salt marsh. If it were left up to realtors and developers, they'd be maybe 10,000 acres because they're trying all they can to get around the restrictions of wetland preservation. So, when I was a child and I saw that movie, Swamp Water, I was so disappointed. I didn't know about saving it either. But it scared the hell out of me. <laughs> when that fellow went down in the quicksand, I never forgot that. <laughs> I was worried about quicksand too. And they, they did it right out here. They did it right here in the park. They made that movie right here. They made several movies out here. Four or five of them. What were some more of them, Martin? Lord of the Wilderness. Lord of the Wilderness. Tender Warrior. Tender Warrior. Swamp Country. Billy? Any more? Living Swamp. What? The Living Swamp. The Living Swamp? Yeah. Swamp Country. Swamp Country. So, uh, today we have different perspectives of, of, of wetlands. Because of, their, <coughs> because of people like that, the people of the and the recent research, we now value our weapons and know that they are the most productive things on earth. Our salt marshes over there produce 18 tons per acre. The most productive environment on earth. It's fed and water twice a day. Fed water twice a day. Every high tide runs all the way in up to every little cranny and little cranny and it stops. And when water stops, what happens to its load? It drops it out. That's called fertilizer. So they're, they're fed the water twice a day. And that crop of Spartina, that is the marsh grass that grows over all those 300,000 acres of corn, soon becomes shrimp, oysters, clams, scallops, lobsters, horseshoe crabs, and millions of other kinds of other critters. So it's the most productive area that we have is our wetlands. Wildlife support, more wildlife than any other kind of environment on wetlands. 300, 424 just in here. 424 different birds. <coughs> the, most, the most plentiful are the birds. 621 different plants and uncounted thousands of insects. Uh, threatened and endangered species. In here we have indigo snake, the gopher tortoise, uh, red cockaded woodpecker. Uh, pardon me? The blue indigo that you said. I'm sorry? You said the blue indigo? The indigo snake, yeah. The indigo snake. Beautiful critters. Flood control. Certainly, along every river in Georgia, every river has a floodplain. And in that floodplain, there's a small swamp there. It may be flooded only once or twice a year, but it's, it's a floodplain, and it serves as wildlife habitat. Uh, and uh, back in the 60s, they decided they were going to, to straighten out the uh, the river down there running out of Okeechobee. What was that? What was the name of that river? 
that big river is draining the Okeechobee, Lake Okeechobee. They were going to take the kinks out of it. So they did. They got in there with the drag lines and did all the straightening it out. Boy, the water just run out of the Lake Okeechobee. They just drained all the land around. Now they're trying to put it back. <laughs> now they're trying to put the kinks back into it. They're having big court battles for the fellows who pay for their land, and now they don't want to sell it. They don't want to sell it because they built homes there. They've been living on it. So there's lots of controversy about what they were borrowed. Uh, our wetlands act as a filter. Our wetlands act as a filter, filtering out heavy metal uh, and, and, and any kind of litter, nitrates, phosphates, heavy metals. By the way, where do we get our most of our heavy metals? It comes from the west in the air in the form of gases and particulate matter. And we get mercury, cadmium, arsenic, and several other heavy metals that are falling into our rivers and in our swamp and in our lakes and on our lawn. Uh, every consumable fish in the state of Georgia has a consumption advisory on it. You can only eat this fish so many ounces, so many days a week, or so many days a month, or once every two months. If you'd like to know the details, go to the DNR office and ask for a consumption advisory on edible fish. Uh, mercury is our one of our biggest pollutants. And we aren't out of the woods yet. We aren't out of the woods. There's still Organizations are still trying to build into the marshes and into the into the swamps. I mean, some of you probably remember a few years ago when E.I. DuPont bought a big chunk of Trail Ridge over here. They bought, great, they bought 40 thousand acres. They were going to dig a hole 50 feet deep, a mile long and a mile wide, and, and drain it, take out all the heavy metals, mainly titanium, ilmenite, glutile, and toxin. All the minerals. That's it. See this black, that black sand. This black sand down here in the sand, that's what it is. That's what makes the beach sand black in places. You see, when the waves burn up on the beach and you try to slowly go back in, you see that black stuff coming in and out. That's, that's titanium with minerals. And they don't really to spend, as a matter of fact, they sent a guy to my class. They sent a guy to my class. I didn't know who it was, never seen him before. But he came to this class back in 94. Uh, fortunately, the stockholders and the people of Georgia stood up on their hind legs and said, not only no, <laughs> not in our backyard. You know. uh, DuPont was a stock company. Stock companies are susceptible to their stockholders and responsible to their stockholders. And when a, a big investor, not me, not most of us, big investors say, I don't think you ought to do that, Mr. DuPont. And they didn't do it. They backed out. They, they changed their mind because somebody got to their pocketbook. So there have been threats to the swamp. Uh, most of them are, are, are under control. Um, but you, you might still see some evidence of, of pollution and abuse on some of our rivers. Uh, if you run down to Satilla, the St. Mary's, in Omaha, sometimes you'll see a couch, a tire, a tennis ball, styrofoam cups, uh, you see all sorts of diapers. Oh, I bet I picked up a hundred baby diapers along the rivers. People just don't care. 
churches don't care where they got their liver. Um, but these are some of the things, some ways that they're impacting uh, dredging and channelization. They did channelization over here on that west side. West side of the swamp, right up in here. They did some channelizing. They straightened out those creeks. Get that water out there so they can draw that timber and slice them down put that dollar in their pocket. Deposition and fill material. Oh, that'll, that'll get them a ticket right quick. Diking and damming. Tilling for crop productions. Mining. There's a mine on the Satilla River right now. Carol? Southern Ionics. Huh? Southern Ionics. Southern Ionics. Uh, what are they mining? The, uh, one of the minerals, I think it was a tannin. I think it was a tannic acid. It's complicated because they're also contributing to Satilla River and trying to be good stewards. Yeah, it's complicated. They're, they're, they're big contributors. So there's, it's also a financial uh, problem. And certainly erosion is a problem, but we don't have erosion here in this flat land. We have very little siltation into the swamp. This is so flat, water will lay there for days before it moves. <laughs> uh, subsidence, we don't have much problem with things sinking. Let's set that, that limestone layer down on the bottom goes down again. Uh, by the way, we used to have artesian wells here, didn't we? We used to have water just come up out of the ground. This back set. There was, a, there was a bar down here between Kingsland and St. Mary's. It was called the Oak, the, the Flowing Well. The Flowing Well. <laughs> and this fellow right here worked it. <laughs> and, and, uh, it ran day and night, 24 hours a day, for years and years and years. It was all that beautiful fresh water. And the local folks would come by and fill their jugs and take it back to the house. And they, take it, they thought it had medicinal qualities. Well, finally, the water table dropped and it quit running. And so the owners put a cap on it, didn't they? They put a cap on it. Uh, and uh, had it completely quit running. They were still running. But, but because the water table had been dropping, trying to conserve water, they put a cap on it. And they, the, the local folks, went to the local authorities and said, we need that water. <laughs> that's, that, that's how we stay healthy. Um, and so there's lots of controversy about that, too. Do we have, do we have, Artesian wells now. When they built the city of Waycross and put down the first city well, the water table was seven and a half feet below the surface of the ground. Seven feet. Now it's 125 feet below the ground. They have to push it out. They have to send pumps way down there. You can pull water, you can only pull water 33 feet, but you can push it a mile. You can push it 20 miles. Can't you, Cornelius? <laughs> Um, Why has the water table dropped so much? Industrialization is one thing. Commercialization, residential development, industrial development, and, and uh, city, city expansion. Residential, commercial, and industrial. The and agriculture. Yeah. And agriculture. And agri ag, yeah. Oh, great. yeah. Ag oh. <coughs> and ag they have a different set of rules that those yeah. guys go by. The farmers have a different set of rules. So were they drawn from the underground water? Yes. Yeah. 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 They go to the aquifer. It's 200 and well, it depends on where you are, but it's anywhere from 200 to 5,000 feet down. And you push them all around. In our home area is a great potato growing area. And it's sand, they use high capacity wells for irrigation. And they will pull upwards to 100,000 gallons a day out of those wells for irrigation. 100,000 gallons a day. I think the red here, up there in Jessica, had a permit or something like that. They don't have permits in Wisconsin, they just do it. The DNR, just, they just follow the DNR, it's rubber stamp. Really? 
Wisconsin. They don't need a permit. We're, still, we're fighting it now to get control of that. Wisconsin has, has lakes around every corner. <laughs> <laughs> Not anymore. Some of them run dry. <clears throat> And, and drought. Drought is, is a problem. Some places. But droughts are absolutely necessary for Hopi. We need drought. Drought does several things. Wetlands are not always wet. They are dry at least a third of their lifetime. Uh, every woody plant in the swamp <coughs> germinated from its seed on dry land on the dry surface. So without drought, we wouldn't have any woody plants out there. Because it, if it was all stayed wet and soggy all the time, those hardwood and the, and the softwoods would not germinate. Any, any hardwood would not germinate. Um, also, um, I forgot where I was going. Oh, drought nest here. See, over the swamp, over the surface of the swamp. Let's see if we can find, it's about 8 o'clock here. Okay. I have to the run, run along here. Oh, here we are. Let me show you some swamp. Some pictures of the swamp when it's full of water. Uh, this is swamp when it's full of water. Oh, I'm sorry. That's, that's hard to see there. But that is when the swamp is full of water. Here's another one. Notice the shape. Notice the shape of these, these structures. The, uh, notice the shape that most of these things are round. Yet when you ride through here, you're right through here, it doesn't look, they don't look right because you can't see. Your perspective is down here, out this way. If looking from an airplane, you can see 360 around every one of them. These are what used to be little blobs of heat that grew up, matured, and self-propagated and, co and continues to live today. Some of them out there are 600 years old. And we'll look at it. Next week, we'll look at how that process occurs. Here's, here, this is Seagrove Lake down on the east side. This is where the Swanee Canal, right there is a tower. Their tower burned too. They lost it. They lost 4,000 feet of boardwalk. So it's going to take an act of Congress to rebuild it. It really is. To fund it. That's going to take a lot of money. But there goes the boardwalk right there. It goes out back through here and zigzags. And back there's Chester Island. Chester Island back here. See, some of them even start out here with little, little round things. There's a wheel down there. <laughs> now, now we're up here to the boat trail. This is a canoe trail. This is, this is the trail over to what we call Mall Town. It's up in the very top of the swamp, right there. It's the nearest to you. It's right there. Mall Hammock is right up, right up in here. And here's the Middle Fork Run, going from Dinner Pond to the, to the right, and down to the left would be Big Water. But notice how they're round. And they have a collar around them. Notice the change in vegetation. The change in vegetation as you approach it. And notice where the big trees are. The big trees where? In the middle. Because how old are they? They're older than everything else. So they're the tallest. So if you look at it from a profile, and, and you look at the edge, it, 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 it looks like this. There's the big ones in the middle, and the smaller ones, the smaller ones, the peripheral. So that kind of structure is called a house, the gable of a house, simply from that resemblance. When it first comes up, it, it's called a badger. It's at the jungle peak. We call it a badger. I can't get it in my flashlight. 
So, all this surface here now is covered with lilies. This is all water lilies. It's all water lilies. Only you see a little bit of water seeping through. Big cypress, especially down, going down through big water and, uh, and, and Minnie's Lake. This is the kind of cypress you see down here. Lots of yellow water lilies on that west side. Water lilies on the, the yellow water lilies on the west. Mostly white water lilies on the east side. And you never know where you're going to run up on here. You may be able to make a turn, you may not see one the rest of the day. But they're out there. 12,000 of them. 12,000. They are magnificent. Here's a little bit. He's just getting started. He's only about seven, eight, maybe nine feet long. And you can tell by the shape of his head, he's a, he's a young digger. He's a very young digger. So they crawl up on the logs, warm up in the day, soaking up all them rays, because tonight the party starts. <laughs> These are nocturnal critters, folks. They, they just warm up for the daytime because they have such acute senses. You cannot imagine them. I'll bring, I'll bring a gator here. So you, you can sit down and look in his mouth and look in his jaws. Up on our jaws are hundreds, three, four, maybe five hundred little tiny pock holes, little tiny holes. And each one is a sensor. And they are directional. Those, those directly in, in, the, in the front of his face point right there. Those right here, they point there. And those back here, they point out there. So he knows where anything that touches water and creates a ripple, if it comes towards him and strikes his one of those sensors, presso receptors is what they are, then he knows where it is, how fast it's moving, and which way it's going. Because as he passes, as the ripples move, they strike different parts of his face. And he can tell which way it's going and how fast it's moving. He has very good vision at night. He has excellent he has color vision, by the way. He, and he has 25 degree binocular vision. 25 degree binocular. The rest of everything out here is monocular. I can't imagine it's the neural circuitry in his brain that separates all those images. But it does. Uh, and so we'll spend the evening with him here. <laughs> Just fascinating. He is. Thank you for your tolerance and patience and your I see you next week.